Hello, my name is Burr Sutter from Red Hat, and we got a lot of fun things to show you in a very short period of time. We're going to dive right in and get right to it. Right now, you can see there's a lot of different ways to get OpenShift 4.5 based on Kubernetes 118. I could start here, but I want to show you how I installed multiple clusters around the globe. I came into this thing called Advanced Cluster Management. You're going to hear more about this in a second, but it was super simple for me to set up a cluster here in Dublin, you can see based on Amazon, or in Sydney based on Google. And of course, even the cluster that I'm looking at right now is sitting in Texas. So I have my three clusters around the globe. I can hit this Add Cluster button and say Create Cluster, and this is exactly what I did. I can call this the Burr Cluster if I want, and then pick any of my public cloud providers. And for instance, I can pick uh, Google Cloud here, pick what version of OpenShift that I want to lay down there, pick my connection. It knows what DNS name I have mapped to that cloud provider already. And of course, the last thing you really have to say is what region would you like it to run in? And in this one, the one I did earlier, runs in Sydney down in Australia Southeast. It's as simple as that to set up your cluster. And then once you have your clusters running, you can dive right into them. Now I want to make this point very clear. The ability to set up a new cluster is super easy. And across all the three public cloud providers, including bare metal or on-premise, or even things like vSphere and other solutions. But look here, I have this thing running on Amazon. As I mentioned, there's my Amazon user interface. You might love it, you might hate it, but there it is. I have the Google running here also, and that's running down in Sydney, down in Australia, and I have Azure running over in Texas. So all three public cloud providers, but the big win for all us Kubernetes users is it's Kubernetes, it's Kubernetes, it's Kubernetes everywhere, and the experience is the same. But I want to turn over to Michael Elder, who's going to take us the rest of the way with ACM. All right. Thank you very much, Bert. Let's take a look at what all we can do with this really powerful capability that Red Hat has recently made available. So in your environment, we saw a couple of clusters created. I've got a, an ACM cluster, uh, a hub in particular, that has several different open shifts from, both, uh, from all three of the major cloud vendors, as well as running in a data center environment. So... Each of these clusters runs an agent that allows us to see what's going on in that cluster. It allows me to drive configuration changes and deliver applications. We'll see the, all of those examples here in just a moment. So for example, if I wanted to trigger an upgrade, I can see what versions are available to every cluster that I have under management. If I wanna simplify upgrading several clusters at once, if upgrades are available, I can trigger an upgrade in a batch and all of them will immediately go off and start triggering that upgrade process. So now it simplifies a administrator's job who's trying to manage many different clusters, understand the inventory and drive changes in behavior. But now if I have clusters attached into their management, what are the things I might like to do? In particular, we often find users want to understand what's going on in their clusters. So our search capability actually indexes everything. Any API or CRD that's available in that cluster, you can now search against uh, Rackham's database and understand what's going on. And this, if I have an app that is spread across many different clusters, now I could do something like find everything that is part of a particular namespace. So let's look at a namespace called WordPress app. And I can see that it has lots of different parts, pods, replicas, secrets, deployments, et cetera. I might wanna drill into what clusters is it currently running upon, see if it's healthy or not healthy. So search becomes a really powerful way to understand the state of those clusters. Now, understanding what's going on is really only part of the problem. We also wanna be able to drive changes against that environment. And so we start to think about how do I drive a consistent configuration story everywhere? So within advanced cluster management, we actually bring a policy management capability that allows me to drive things like configuring authentication or authorization for every cluster. We use a very simple uh, concept of placement rule that matches against the labels that I've assigned to the cluster. It will record the decision and tell me whether or not I'm compliant. And this particular example will push an OAuth configuration directly in to any cluster that I need uh, to have this particular policy applied. Let's take a quick, quick look at one example. Here I've actually got a concept of image manifest vulnerabilities. It's already deployed against two clusters. Kilo Alpha, Kilo Bravo, and I can see that it's discovered image vulnerabilities in those clusters. Let's uh, target another cluster. So we'll actually go and just edit that live. And here I can say enforce secure images. I'm gonna go and assign this condition to my Charlie cluster. We'll add that new label. 
done. And then over here on the right, we're very quickly going to see it pop up. I'm going to see if I can catch it in the act. So here we'll look at, I now have a new decision recorded. And then over the next few seconds, we'll actually see that container security operator automatically get pushed out to Charlie and bring it into compliance. Now, the other aspect of managing config is really about applications. So when we think about applications, we're delivering um, any kind of deployment. Typically, these are managed in GitHub. They're managed in Helm repositories, object store, et cetera. And the notion of Rackham's delivery model allows it to pull directly from those sources and syndicate the app across your environment. So here again, I'm still driving them with placement rules. I have a set of cluster selectors that define what labels clusters need to have to run part of that application. I'm defining subscriptions that link back from some source. And in all the examples that we see here, these are actually driven from a public GitHub repo. That same application is actually available uh, here. And it actually points to the Git repo for Kubernetes and then does what's needed to configure that application. So this is just a whirlwind tour. What we went through is how we can drive upgrades of clusters, how we can manage configuration policies across those clusters, how we can deliver applications, and how we can search. So with that, Burr, I'd like to pass it back to you. That is absolutely amazing. I love what you did there with the search. I love what you did there with the policy management and of course the application management. Really cool stuff to see all those components in that centralized location. So at this point, we gotta dive in and do something else. We're gonna see some Knative, some Tecton, some Kafka, and the magic of how that's been done now in OpenShift with William Marquito Oliveria. Thank you, Bart. Here's what I got for you. So I have an OpenShift cluster here with some operators already installed. I have the MQ streams that's based on the Streamz CNCF project that we donated to CNCF. That's our Kafka operator. And we have pipelines based on Tecton and serverless as well, based on Knative. So now what I'm going to do is deploy a serverless container, a serverless application. I'm going to start here from a container image that I've built before. I'm selecting the image here. The application name comes up. And here, with a single click, right, I can make that container run as a serverless application, right? It's very straightforward. And by selecting that, I can also configure a couple other things from that serverless application. So for example, I'm just limiting the number of concurrent pods uh, being running uh, to handle those events. So while that application is coming along here, I can also repeat that same process uh, if I want to import a project from Git, right? That same experience, again, I can start from a Git URL that's going to trigger a build. And I also have the serverless, the Knative service option here to, to run as well. And I can do that also with a Docker file, right? If I have a Docker file here or in a Git repo, I can also deploy that application as a serverless application as well. So our application is already running. So while I'm doing that, let me also demonstrate how you can create your own Kafka cluster using the MQ streams operator, right? So I'm just going to go back here to the admin console. Uh, I'm going to transition to a different project and select Kafka. So I have one Kafka cluster running already. I'm going to start a new one. Uh, let's give this one a name. So my Kafka cluster, uh, if I could type my Kafka cluster. There you go. I can configure a couple of things for, for the Kafka cluster as well. Number of brokers, details about security and whatnot. I can also use a YAML, right, if I want, but I'm going to stick to the user interface for now. Uh, hit create. Let's take a quick look at all the resources coming up. So you can see that this is a real Kafka cluster, right? Again, all the brokers, uh, Zookeeper, and everything else are starting up. And you see, again, all the details about configuration and security as well. So that's pretty cool. But I'm not going to wait for that. Again, we don't have enough time. Let's go back to our serverless project and our serverless application. Uh, the application, as you can see, scaled down to zero because, of course, no events were sent to that app. But that's going to change now because I'm going to add an event source to that application. And here you can see the list of event sources available in the system. I'm going to use Kafka. And I'm going to select here the broker URL, uh, pick a topic, uh, consumer group. Uh, I could also set some security settings. But again, I'm not going to mess with that now for the demo. Create. That's now set. So I have an event source associated with my application. But I still, of course, have not started sending events to the app. So I'm going to start a new process here that is essentially a Kafka producer running inside OpenShift and send a couple messages. And you see that application coming up, scaling uh, up. 
as I send those messages. So test message, there you go. Test message two. Let's take a quick look at the logs of our pod. View logs. So you see here the text that I just sent. Let me send one more. Test three, there you go. And this is a cloud event. So even though I sent a string, that's going to be converted to a cloud event here. I can also start this other application that is essentially going to post a couple of different uh, uh, JSON objects to that application as well. So just you can see the scale, right, starts to happen and you can see the number of pods going up to match the demand, okay, to match the number of events that I'm sending to that application. Let's take a quick look at those events. You can see that the event here, it matches uh, an order. Again, just like you would get from any, uh, pretty much any e-commerce, right? Again, just an object, a JSON object and whatnot. So this is all great. I have my application running, but what you can do as well with OpenShift is also create a pipeline. So can I, so, 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 so that I can automate the CI and CD, right, for my application. I'm gonna start here with the pipeline builder that is based on Tekton. I can select again a number of tasks. So the first thing here for my pipeline is gonna be a Git clone. The next thing is going to be uh, a jib, Gradle build, because that's what I'm using for my app. And the next thing here is going to be a KN create. And then I can come here and configure specifics and whatnot. But again, we don't have enough time. So what I did, I already have a YAML for that whole pipeline that I built before. And I'm just going to copy and paste that here, hit create. So that's the same pipeline that we did before, but now I can start that pipeline. Again, specifics for where that container image is going to land. And here I'm just picking the PVC that is going to be used as a workspace uh, to share the resources, right? And so, so now the Git clone has started. Essentially, once this is done, you have a serverless application deployed. Uh, and that's pretty much it. That's all I have for, for you today. Thanks. That is totally awesome stuff. I love it. There's one more thing, though, I want to make sure we show because we want to show people this concept of the virtual machine. I mentioned that we now have virtual machines as first-class citizens in OpenShift. If I come down here and click on workloads, you'll see virtualization right here. Now, why might you have a virtual machine in your OpenShift environment, in your Kubernetes cluster as a first-class citizen? It's because as a developer, and I'm a developer, I want to make sure that I have access to my legacy application infrastructure as well as my new cloud-native systems that I'm working on. So I might have a simple virtual machine that, in this case, let's go ahead and build one from this wizard. I'll call this my accounting application, let's say. And then I can load it up from a certain source. This is, of course, the virtual machine disk image. I can pick one from a container or maybe a URL or actual disk image. In this case, I'll pick the container image because I already have that in my copy and paste buffer. This is based on Fedora in this case, but you could have CentOS, you could have Windows servers, you could have a rail system. I'll go ahead and pick the Fedora. Go ahead and say that this is a t-shirt size, small, medium, large. We'll just call this, actually this is a small one, let's make it small. And then of course, just make desktop just to keep it easy. But this is an actual working application, we'll show you that in a second. And all I gotta do now is answer a few more questions. If there's special networking configuration, special storage configuration, if there's other aspects of it. But in this case, I'll just say review and create. And if we look at our list, you'll see that this is loading in that image. And all I would have to do is hit start virtual machine. So it'll take a few seconds to start up that virtual machine in my overall cluster. So let me just go ahead and show you the one I have running right here called My Fedora, one I already launched earlier. And the cool thing about it is to kind of prove you that, to you that this is a virtual machine, I'll click on console. And how about this? Let's try this. So sudo, uh, sudo, there we go, systemctl. If I can type that correctly, you can then, of course, interact with systemd. And I've already started launching processes in there for HTBD, FTP, and other components that I have prepped inside that application because it does have a bunch of transactional data here. Let me kind of show you that real quick. And let me show you my transactions over here, right there. So there's a bunch of XML files for my legacy application. Now, one last thing I'll show you to prove that all this is working. I'll come back over here to Advanced Cluster Management for Kubernetes, and let's see if we can actually find those guys, those virtual machines. And I can type virtual machine here, and you can see there is, in fact, my accounting virtual machine and my Fedora running out there. So again, Advanced Cluster Management sees all around all these clusters and gives you one complete experience to manage all of it across the Open Hybrid Cloud. If you'd like to learn more, visit us at openshift.com.